I'm going to share a story with you today. We have about 150 uh, employees, um, I think about 80 contractors. We're in five regions around the world doing operations and aftercare, supporting law enforcement and um, putting up numbers like we never have and, and doing more rescues than, than ever before. And, and really, I thank you. You're the ones that make it happen. Um, you're the light that we take in, into the darkness. And so it's to you that I want to tell this story. It's probably the most significant rescue operation I've ever been a part of uh, just happened this year. And it was God-directed, and it was revealing more than just rescuing a bunch of kids, hundreds, probably thousands in the end. Uh, it was an operation that proved to me why we exist, why a private organization would function and need to function within the other, the many governments who we support who cannot move how we need them to move to rescue children. If you know my origin story, I, I spent 12 years uh, in, the UN, in the government as an undercover operator, special agent with Homeland Security, fighting child crimes and trafficking, and just couldn't move fast enough because of all sorts of things, jurisdictional limitations and, and bureaucracy, and it just got so frustrating that we thought we'd try it privately. And, and uh, there's no other way we could have pulled off this operation, which we're calling the hidden war. Um, there's no way we could have otherwise blown through six countries, six governments, and rescued hundreds of children, all in the small window of four months. It began in Ukraine. We went to Ukraine, and I don't care about the politics. It has nothing to do with this. These are children, orphans, who were in bomb zones, target zones, and we went in to just get them out. We went in in an extraction effort. That's where I thought it was going to end. I credit my wife with this whole thing. When Russia invaded Ukraine, she said, you got to go to Ukraine. You need to put your boots on the ground. I said, hey, we have a Europe office now. Like, I don't have to be everywhere. And she, she just, in, through her tears and biting her lip because she didn't want to say it, but she knew she had to because she felt it. You need to go yourself. And what she was mostly worried about was 12 kids. The OUR was working to get out of the country through adoption. There's some countries that are high trafficking areas and that, we have a project called Children Need Families where we find families and provide grants. There's some countries, and Ukraine happens to be one, where if you're an orphan, the chances of you being trafficked or exploited are so high. And so we knew that when the war began, when Russia invaded, all those adoptions got shut down and she wanted me to go find these kids. I didn't want to go. I was scared to go. Bombs were dropping <laughs> and I didn't know how effective we could be. But God works with the law of witnesses, and within a very unusual, bizarre uh, witness appeared within an, an hour or two of my wife insisting I go to Ukraine. Got a phone call from Mel Gibson. He actually did the final edit of The Sound of Freedom. That's how we know each other, but not well, not well enough that I'd be getting phone calls. And he told me that he was in Budapest at the time. This was right hours after the invasion, and he said he supports a bunch of orphans in Ukraine, and he was worried about them, and he asked if I could help get them out. So now I've got 12 from my wife, I got about 13 others from Mel Gibson. And I'm thinking, okay, I got this list of kids I got to get out. Um, I told Mel, I said, you got to help me. This is going to be expensive. I won't ask you for direct donation, but can you help me film this? You know, let's film what's happening so we can get people to understand and they can support us. He said, no problem. He helped us get set up and started filming. Four months later, what I thought was going to be maybe a documentary about Ukraine ends up being a four-part docu-series that's almost done. It's being produced by DNA Films and executive produced by Tony Robbins. That's how crazy it got and how prophetic my wife was. When I showed up in Ukraine with a list of, I think, 20 names, the Ukrainians countered me and gave me over 10,000 names of orphans that they didn't know where they were because of the chaos caused by war. And more importantly and, and more frightening to me was the fact that I know that human trafficking is a $32 billion a year business. It's the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world. And I also know how kids get forced into that market. And it's through vulnerable situations like in the aftermath of a hurricane, mostly in a developed country or an earthquake, or in this case, a war. And so the traffickers call it harvest time. And that was the intel we were getting. And so we weren't just there to extract those kids, but look for leads. And it really was a miracle what happened. You know, it's, it's one of these things that, you know, faith precedes the miracle. I take a lot of comfort 
in the fact that there's only one time in the scripture where Jesus gets mafioso. It's righteous because it's Jesus doing it. But if you listen to his words, it's mafioso. He says that it would be better for you to have a millstone cast about your neck and you thrown to the bottom of the sea than that you would hurt one of these little ones, my children. That's mafioso action, sinking someone to the bottom of the ocean. And Jesus said it. So I know where he stands on it. So I can expect and we can expect miracles when we're fighting to protect children. I never thought, I never dreamed there'd be a day when this world that I've been fighting for 20 years doing child crimes cases and human trafficking cases, these guys have always been peripheral Monsters, but peripheral, rogues, renegades, hiding out. Not anymore. The culture has changed. Evil has gripped our nation. We want to go find these Ukrainian war victims uh, who are missing. Little children crying over the dead bodies of their parents. And a van comes up and says, hey, we'll take you. And so now we're in about March of this year. And that's when another miracle walks in. This female you see. She had been recruited by another organization who we work with called Free a Girl in Europe. Turns out she's 35 years old. She's an actress. She's brilliant. And she can look 12 or she can look 25 or 30, whatever. It's, it just, and she was the top of the class. So the second day of the training is when I get this lead from a Dutch police asset, a friend of mine, who reveals to me about this guy, Nelson Matzman, the leader of a political party that was formed in, in 2016 and reformed in 2020. Um, and these guys, their goal is to legalize sex with children. This guy, even by Dutch standards, which is pretty tough to get arrested in Holland for anything, and even he's arrested along with three of his lieutenants. So even the Dutch arrest them, but the Dutch don't do what they should. They give their passports back, let them wait their trial in freedom, and they take off. And no one knows where they are. But they're discovered because this Matman guy, at least, pokes his head out online because he's looking to traffic Ukrainian kids. He's in the sex market in Mexico. He's been there for two years. And that's how he gets revealed. So this Dutch cop calls me and he says, hey, I don't think my government's going to do anything about this. And said, I know you guys would do something with this. So off we went with our team from Eastern Europe into Mexico. We set this whole operation up. We got him out. And we got him to give us information about where the next guys were. Because we got him, he's the leader, but what are his, were his lieutenants? And his lieutenants, a guy named Martin and a guy named Leslie. Um, and how we set it up, we brought him to this suite in Mexico City. He believed I was an American trafficker that he was going to work with to get kids. I still do undercover work occasionally. You wouldn't recognize me, right? But we have prosthetics, and I have prosthetic scars I can put on my face. So this guy... He had no idea. We get this party for him, and he doesn't want to talk. He's scared to death, which we knew he would be, which is why we set the hotel near a huge park in Mexico City, because he wouldn't talk to us in the party because he's scared. He's the most wanted pedophile in the world. I just need to ask him one question. The Mexicans already got him. They got him on gun possession, child exploitation material, all sorts of stuff. They did a phenomenal job. I just wanted to get him to talk to me. So I could only ask him one time, where is Martin and Leslie? But I have to wait, because if I ask him twice... I'm too curious. So I waited till we went down to the park. I watched his body just relax. He turns to me and he says, I now know you're not a cop. And I said, how do you know I'm not a cop? And he says, because you would have arrested me in the hotel room. I said, yeah, I would have. Again, all part of the plan. And then he said, I know you're not a Dutch assassin because for the same reason, you would have killed me up in the hotel room, not in a public park. I said, you're absolutely right, man. I, I am who I say I am. And so a few minutes later, I knew I could go for the, the kill shot, and, and I asked him, so where are those guys, Leslie and Martin? I read about them. And now he's relaxed. He knows I'm not a cop. And he says, well, they run a sex hotel. I knew exactly what he was saying, a child sex hotel. These pedophiles will set up a home, a hotel. People will come in, pay top dollar. And these guys were after little boys. In fact, if you were 11 years old, you were too old to be in this sex hotel, 10 years and younger. So he's telling me this, and I said, well, I'd love to go to that hotel. He's like, I don't know you well enough yet. I can't take you there. I said, well, have you been there? He says, yeah, I've been there. And I said, good. That's really all I needed to know, because I'll, I'll not find out where it is, because we're raiding your house tonight. I didn't tell him this. This was in my head. We're raiding your house tonight, and your passports are going to be there, and I'll find. I said, well, how long were you there? He says, I was a bartender there for about two months. I said, oh, perfect. There's not going to be more than two countries. 
where you were bar- where you were somewhere for two months. Um, sure enough, uh, we raided the house that night. Our intel unit then, it just took him a few hours to find. We got the passport. Ecuador was the country that he had been in. We did a deep dive in the dark net and all through uh, social media and found that uh, Leslie, he made a mistake one time, used his real name on an Airbnb ad, a guy named Leslie, which is not a Latin American name, obviously, and was advertising a little boutique hotel in a little village on the beach in a town called Canoa in Ecuador. So we head over to Ecuador. Um, also, there's a few countries. We work in 30, about 20, 30 countries, but there's two countries that you really don't want to be hiding in if we're looking for you. And one of them is Mexico, and one of them is Ecuador. And that just happens to be where these guys, again, you, you just see heaven's hand over this whole thing. We got a warrant. Again, I, I, gotta, I have to recognize God's hand one more time here, because when we got to the hotel, um, you know, 50-50 chance. Is it them? Probably, maybe not. Who knows? We got there within an hour of setting surveillance up on this little hotel. Uh, we see the faces pop out of the window, walk out of the door of, of Martine and Leslie. It was a positive hit, but we didn't have enough evidence. There wasn't enough evidence to break the place down and go into that house. And right then, the second hour of day one of surveillance, two other guys come walking out of the house. They were the next guys on the list we were going to look for. They just happened to be visiting and abusing children at the time we showed up. And they took their computers and we, we tracked them to the Guayaquil airport. They flew to Miami, probably maybe to set something up here. But we called Homeland Security, our friends there, and they picked them up, found evidence of child exploitation material. They were wrapped up. They're now back in jail in Holland. And we got the evidence we needed in like a little window to get the warrant for the hotel. And you're clapping for God right now because that was just, um, that was just nothing but a miracle. How could that happen right then? And so we were able to breach the house, go in, and then at that point, there was about 400 children that we have so far identified. We've, we've never seen something like this. We have actually set up an aftercare home in Kanoa, in the village itself, because almost every child there has probably been abused. The really good news is the prosecutor reached out to us a few weeks ago, and he said that when we hit the hotel, I remember seeing it was in a state of rebuild. They were, they were renovating it, and the prosecutor confirmed these guys hadn't really even launched the business out yet. They had just kind of tested it. So, I mean, the timing, it was God's timing, before they finished it. So we prevented probably thousands of children over many, many years of being exploited in this little remote village. I finally get home from this operation. I remember sitting in my living room, just kind of decompressing. I looked over and saw my wife doing all the things. You know, we have uh, nine children and just craziness all the time. And and I started just crying, looking at her, because I realized something. That, I mean, she was much braver than me. Can you imagine sending your husband and you have nine children into a war zone without really a really clear objective? Uh, just because she knew the Lord was telling her to send me to do that? Um, and it just didn't hit me till four months later what actually happened. The biggest miracle, the most beautiful miracle of all of them was that she didn't even know. She couldn't articulate why, but God knew that there were 400 plus children and thousands of targets um, streaming out of the sex hotel in Canoa, Ecuador, and other victims in Mexico and maybe around the world. And he knew that they were there. And he knew that he just had to tell one of his daughters to send her husband to Ukraine and that he'd take care of the rest. And that was the biggest miracle of all. Um, The most important fruit, I think, is what we discovered when we dug deep into this literature of this political party. It was shocking. It's this big reveal. I'm almost finished with a book called The Child Trap, which will be coming out in a couple months here. Um, And it's shocking. We identified seven, we call them the PNDs, the Pedophile Network Doctrines. This is what they are preaching and have been preaching. Pedophiles organized around the world have been preaching these doctrines for decades. The child abuse is always in the name of liberating the child. This is not about me. This is not about my lust as a pedophile. This is about the children that need to be liberated. The LGBTQ movement, they're the enemies unless they let the pedos join. In other words, the pedos want to eliminate the name pedophile because that's derogatory. You know what they're trying to change the name to, right? The minor attracted persons. 
They want LGBTQMAP. And they write about how the LGBT movement, if they don't let the MAP add, then they're the enemies. And for the most part, the LGBT movement is not letting them in. Some of my friends who, who I follow, an amazing group called Gays Against Groomers. Like, you're not going to come in here. We are not going to be part of this. Parents are the enemy. Unless they let the pedos have their children, the four provide an excess of sexual content to children. you got to fill their heads with sex. In their literature, it's all about liberating the minds of these children. But give them sex, give them sex, give them porn. Their brains are going to congeal and form around that. They're sex addicts by the time they're 12 or 13. It's exactly what the pedophiles want, don't they? That's what they're trying to do. Normalize the adult-child sex relationship through legalizing child exploitation material. Adding new terminology like minor attractive persons. Hide and disguise the harmful effects, including scientific evidence that their agenda might have on children. For example, what's happening with science on pornography. And then, of course, number seven, you must remove God from any education. Because, of course, God is the great protector of children. They're fearful of that. Do these doctrines look familiar at all? Every single one of these doctrines is being promoted by the godless woke in this country. Whoever is promoting these ideologies, these doctrines, even if it's your sweet grandma, she needs to be dealt with. So I don't care who it is, it doesn't matter. It just so happens that right now, it's the woke in this country. One of the scariest ones is number six. I'm going to elaborate on that and then I'll finish up. I don't care what adults do. This is about children. And it's about foisting upon them a woke agenda where if they're feeling depressed and like these young girls are feeling depressed or whatever, and they're just told, therapists are told, right, you can only diagnose one thing, gender dysphoria, you can only tell them that they're in the wrong body. There's something deeper, darker, and scarier than that. Age is fluid, age is fluid. Guess what that means? The kids are getting sexual material through public schools is, is the most obvious thing in the world. That's not even debatable. And it's porn. I mean, I've seen things that, are, that teachers are giving kids, especially in California, that we would probably arrest people for back when I was an agent in California for distributing harmful material to minors. And now it's not just illegal, it's encouraged apparently. So the kids are getting the sex, they're getting addicted. Now the pedophile's getting, hey, you, you, you're not only in the wrong body, but geez, you, you, you're the wrong age. I mean, don't you identify as a 30-year-old? 12-year-old kid? Don't you identify as a 30-year-old? Well, yeah, if you tell me I do, because I do whatever you tell me, teacher union. And, and Mr. Therapist, I might be a 40-year-old pedophile, and shoot, I might identify as a, as a 10-year-old. Now, what are you going to do when mom and dad say, whoa, 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 you've crossed the line. You can't do it, mom and dad. It's too late. You've bought into it. You don't want to be a parent. You want to get an award for letting your kid be a cat. I mean, you heard of the furries, right? There's kitty litter in certain schools, I understand, here in, in Utah, because the kid wants to be a cat, and the parents are getting awards, and they're getting praised. The laws are congealing around this. It's just a matter of time, in certain states especially, where when that kid says, I'm not only in the wrong body, Mom, I am 30 years old, and my boyfriend is 50, and he identifies as a 12-year-old lion anyway, so it doesn't matter. And there's nothing you can do, because the laws are going to have the backs of the pedophiles who've manipulated those children, and that's the end of our civilization. Do you think it's a coincidence? Every great republic that ever got to the age that we are at right now, they all they died. The Romans, Greek, and they all had pedophilia legalized at that last moment. This is the fight that we are in. There's a silent majority that can see this, but we've got to stand up and we have to fight. Kids are now at the center. They are the target for the darkness that's affecting our nation. And it's you, it's, it's Eagle Form and, and like-minded people that need to stand up. And I thank you for doing that. And I pray the Lord's blessing on our joint efforts to protect these children from this evil, dark ideology. So let's go do it. Thank you guys and, and God bless you.